Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I heard Michael say 15 to 20 minutes, and inside my head I said, just stay inside the, in the, li inside the lines for 20 minutes and don't get yourself in trouble, and then you can be more evocative when the camera goes off. But uh, let's see, let's see if I have had any adaptive learning and maturity. Um, so thanks to the Institute again for the invitation, and, and again, what a remarkable week uh, you've had. I was looking at the program. Um, if I didn't have to be here, this would be the one I'd have missed this week, uh, personally, <laughs> and I'd have, I'd have come to the others. Um, so it is remarkable to the Institute, and I want to give credit to the Institute for, um, again, putting on such a stimulating um, group at such a really, really interesting uh, time. Um, I guess to start with, and maybe get myself in trouble given my day job, is I want to put forward the thought that perhaps the business communities got too big too fast for the scale of our society. And I'm going to try to give some uh, facts about this. But the danger in that sentence then is that the society would be better off then if business was to get smaller, um, slower. Uh, for the society. And I think that would be the wrong proposition. Um, I think what's happened to us is an incredible, fortuitous opportunity that other generations of, of Irish people would not believe how this generation finds itself right now in terms of the scale of affluence that is right throughout our society. And I can see some of you bristle already in saying it's not for everybody, but let, run with me for a while, and then we can do it in the Q&A, the violent objection to the charge of affluence that Irish people seem to bristle at. Love the austerity cascade, uh, but affluence is, is far too uh, high. But yet the statistics on which I will draw upon will suggest that this is an affluent society of fairly significant proportion, and that a lot of this has happened rather fast and then when you look at the scale of the business community, which I have the honor of being a representative of, um, never in our history, and in fact I would argue geographically never in the history of many jurisdictions has a society moved as dramatically as Ireland on the scale of, of the resources that have come in here in the last five years. So that's, that's kind of um, what I'd like to do in the next 15 to uh, 20 minutes and then open it up. So first of all, and I've said this before, uh, on the debate about whether GDP is a good measure or a bad measure or an accurate measure, uh, I've always firmly been off the view is that while I know GDP is not accurate, I believe it to be right. Um, and so, you know, it's an imprecise way of measuring um, economies, lots of things left out, lots of things included you might want to be in there, etc., etc. But the notion that the 2015 numbers, the leprechaun economics jibes, somehow was an aberration that has no tangible substance into our society is demonstrably false. And let me try to uh, talk about why I think that is so, why, we, why this generation is um, lucky, um, but the problem about luck is you've got to be mature enough to make sure that luck doesn't become a winner's curse and actually destroy uh, your society. So think of a family that wins the lottery. Two types of families, those who can cope with it and that, that good fortune that while it arrives in this generation, if used by that generation, can make that family better off for generations to come or the family that wins the lottery and has a great time for a short time, but actually destroys quite a lot of the fabric that is the family with generational consequences of both regret and so on. And that's kind of the, the, the narrative I want to bring forward as a society right now. So what was our lottery win? Well, the lottery win is we happen to be alive at a moment where in business, to use that example, the world has very firmly changed from a situation where value is, in, particularly as reported in corporate balance sheets, is now very heavily dominated by intangible assets as opposed to tangible assets. So if you go back to 1975, just as a year I happen to have the data for, it basically was an 80-20 rule. 
top 200, 500, 800, 1,000 companies. It's pretty much uh, uh, consistent. Balance sheets will be 80% tangible assets and 20% intangible assets. And those of you who didn't have the benefit of some first-year accountancy, the intangible assets kind of are called goodwill. And even though today we call them brands or patents or copyrights or whatever, it's still actually goodwill. Because to be able to enforce your intellectual property, you need the goodwill of a social contract and a construct that people allow you to actually uh, do that and you're protected by the law and society. So goodwill is pretty much driving a lot of the balance sheets now because we have the reverse. Today, the situation is that it's the 80-20 has flipped around. But it's even been more dramatic than that. You don't have to go back to 1975. I just lent on that as a, as a data point. 10 years ago or 12 years ago, the top 10 companies in the world were increasingly tangible companies in the sense of tangible assets being their driving balance sheet force. So these were oil and gas companies, four of the top 10 companies in the world would be in oil and gas. If Exxon are still knocking around there, just about. Uh, General Electric, a phenomenal company, and still a phenomenal company, um, is no longer in the top 10. It's not even in the Dow Jones Industrial Average anymore uh, because they've been replaced by companies that have intangible assets being their primary um, driver. So you know the Googles, Apples, Amazons, etc. But it would be a mistake to think that this is a phenomenon of tech companies. Because increasingly, when you look around and see other types of companies and substance companies, you will see that as well. Glambia being um, an example um, that I've had for some time in my head. I remember Siobhan uh, Talbot told me, I think in the year 2000, uh, Glambia had exactly 1 million euros, an M, not a B, 1 million euros of goodwill on the balance sheet at that particular point, and about 12 months out of date perhaps, but it had reached 1.6 billion of goodwill on the Glambia balance sheet uh, in the last 12 months. So it's not just tech companies. This phenomenon of intangible assets being a driver of the vast majority of companies is a very significant part. That trend um, then meeting the world changing and the need to try to tax corporations gave rise to a situation where we now have the OECD looking at, in this new world of intangibility, how do we tax intangible versus tangible, and where is the nexus in which to tax? And evocatively, the word that comes out is substance, which is often why we have a campaign in IBE called the model of substance. And again, this idea, particularly for a predominantly uh, Catholic society, transubstantiation is not a, a new idea, um, the idea of moving between tangible and intangible um, in trending is, uh, conceptually at least, something that we can cope with. And so the substance idea here is that you must have your corporate tax strategy aligned with where the substance is. And of course, in the world of oil fields, um, then the tax strategy would have to move to where the, the oil is, evocatively. But in an intangible world, the intangible assets can move to where the tax strategy is. And so I don't need to repeat what, they are, what Ireland is to this audience. Uh, so we clearly had a well-defined um, corporate tax strategy, branded 12.5%, et etc. et cetera. But we're also part of the European Union, which gave that stability. And so the tournament, as people started to move their corporate balance sheets away from the Caribbean islands, because they couldn't show substance in those jurisdictions, they wanted to move to Europe, which had substance. And then the choice within Europe was to uh, land in a member state that was favorable and the favorability is often discounted or not taken account of is common law legal systems. Common law legal systems are much easier to deal with intangibility and fast moving, shift shaping uh, uh, events than codified law, which needs to know what something exists to go through, to codify it, etc. Common law can be much more fluid. And so Ireland and the UK were the big beneficiaries in 2012, 2013 of this big nascent move of intangible assets. So we had companies moving to Ireland in 12 and 13, but also Britain were experiencing that as well. So for instance, Pfizer, that great company and still a top 10 company in the world, has attempted to become European twice in the last um, seven years. First by becoming British through the AstraZeneca deal, 
and then in 2000, that was blocked, and then in 2016, uh, tend to become European again by becoming Irish through inverting through um, Allergan. And again, that was uh, a change of tax code in the UK. They backed off from that. But here's a top 10 company moving into a jurisdiction as a result of this trend. So in 2015, this, this um, very significant year for Ireland, um, the corporate balance sheet in Ireland tells the story of the leprechaun economics jibe. And the fact that it wasn't um, taken account of, I think, has given rise to a kind of a misinterpretation. Uh, the rights or wrongs of it are a different issue. That we can discuss the equity and the ethics and all of that kind of issues. Although I do find it offensive sometimes taking lessons from generations who have colonized the world for tangible assets in the past, who certainly now have quite po-faced about tut-tutting. Um, but in the, same, in the same regard, what we're looking at is that the corporate balance sheet in Ireland increased by 40% in 2015 alone. And the reason is that Ireland was the winner takes all, because Britain, which had been our competitor at the start, aggression um, of Osborne and Cameron around the corporate tax, like the patent income box, a 10% uh, knowledge box, knowledge development box, was our reaction to that, etc. The tournament was between the two jurisdictions, really, for capturing this moving corporate balance sheets. So Ireland wins because Britain made uncertainty. And it wasn't even Brexit. It was the uncertainty about the breakup of the United Kingdom at that point that gave Ireland its advantage. It was the Scottish independence referendum that created the uncertainty. So a 40% balance sheet increase for a sophisticated audience means that uh, the P&L extraction from those balance sheets, which is a flow concept, is broadly similar to the GDP concept. They're not perfect, but they're a proxy. And so what you see from the increase in the balance sheet was that the transaction, the P&L, the type of GDP activity, was a 60 billion flow. And that 60 billion flow uh, captured by GDP meant that our GDP increased by 34% in money terms in 2015. We're perfectly explainable from the balance sheet. But with the balance sheet movement, was an incredible step up. So it's the equivalent of finding oil. Because the new oil is intellectual property. And Ireland's been in the vanguard of frontier economy in that regard. And so Ireland is both a frontier economy and a resource economy in modern terms. This is the lottery win. And to give you a sense of the scale of that is that the 2015, the corporate tax returns were already revealing the phenomenon long before the CSO in July of 16 brought out the numbers. The expectation from the Department of Finance was for a 4.2 billion uh, return on corporate taxes in 15, but it came in at 6.9 billion. So there's nothing wrong in getting the forecast wrong. All I want to make the point is that the change was 2.9 billion off a surprise in corporate tax revenue. But 2.9 billion, while it's, it's a fair bit of money in of itself, is actually the end of the pipe. It is the money that you get from the profits that were in the balance sheets that were in your society in that year. So in other words, in an effect of 10%, just to keep my numbers easy, there was a 29 billion euro miss in our uh, company accounts as I mean, the nation's company accounts on that particular year. So in other words, it was the equivalent of missing um, 29 Ryanairs. If you think of Ryanair doing a billion euro of profits, or CRH, or a, a Kerry, or whoever it might be. So it's a very significant miss. But that's just grown over the last number of years. Then there's the point, and conscious of time, then there's the point to say, well, that's just all funny money, and it's only just in balance sheets. And yes, that's a, that's a spin-off to the uh, society. Um, but what has it done for the individuals in that society? Well, what we've observed, and we're into the sixth year now in a row, so this is not temporary. It's not one year off. It may be a once-off epoch in a generation, and I do believe it to be, and that is all the issues about sustainability and how you use the resources. It is now the case, let me just make another statement here, it is now the case that it has actually given Irish households a huge surge in income. And in fact, it is very clear that Irish households are clearly living within their means. Irish households are living within their means in spectacular fashion. Irish households have, no, have now more money on deposit in our banking system than they have borrowings from the banking system in a phase of zero interest rates. 
It's perverse. The reason they may have that is because they're rationed from getting the things that they might actually want, which is family formation and housing units. So they're ready to pounce in terms of having the cash ready to go if the opportunity arises. So maybe a symbol not of something positive, but perhaps of something negative, being rich but rationed, not being able to get your hands on the assets that they require. But it's also the case that disposable income over that six-year period has now increased by 25%. But when you say percentages like economists do, it's generally baseless. So have you ever had a conversation with economists where talk about 5% growth, but nobody knows what 5% of what? What does it mean? So I was on with Ivan Yates actually on Monday, it feels like a month ago already, and there were, you know, 2020, what's going to happen in the new year, what's your forecast? Uh, and I guess the forecast is, if you look out there, in money terms, because economists, a bit like, economists would be a bad medic, because they don't tell you about your respiratory system. You say, how am I in my respiratory? You say, you're fine. But your blood system's actually poisoned. You're, you know, you're only a half the story. So you're only talking about volume, and you don't know about the price. Um, and you say, well, we seem to be fine. So whatever it is, 3.5% volume growth, maybe 1.5% price growth, 5% next year, or this year. It's not necessarily a forecast. It's an exercise I want to go through. If it is 5%, that means that GDP in Ireland will increase by 15 billion euros. And there's 5 million of us now, which is 3,000 euros of an increase for the year. In those terms, if some family member wrote a cheque for 3,000 euros and gave it to each member of the family over Christmas, we'd say, oh, it could be a good year. It's quite a nice gift to get. So that forecast, which is now kind of presented as an economy slowing down in Ireland, oh, it's only going to be 3.5%, it's beginning to slow and cool off. But actually, in reality, that's the type of, of a generation of activity measurement, is a 3,000 per person uh, delta in there. Um, and this is getting reflected in the incomes. So Irish households have self-reported through the household budget survey what they spend and what they earn. So the average Irish household is now has income of over 70,000 euros. There's 2.9 persons or three persons per household. Uh, their disposable income um, is pretty much at the same level because the actual share of the average Irish household in terms of income tax is still in so low single digit. Um, so we don't, not a high taxed um, household. So the households have the money and they're spending it, but they're not able to spend enough of it to actually stop their savings going up, the point they're living with their means. But what's supplementing their means if the state is trying to go in an investment? Well, it's actually the largesse coming from the corporate tax revenue is supplementing what the household should be paying in terms of the delivery of the public services which they profess to want. So it's going to be rather uncomfortable in an election cycle knocking on the door and saying, you've got the money, we want it, to actually deliver the things that you say you want, like better public services and more GPs and more teachers and more security for the state. The Irish households have the money. They choose not to give it up willingly, and they choose to spend in consumption patterns that are very dramatic. And while they might be anecdotal, we see commentary about our criminal gangs are moving out of Ireland because the market is saturated in illicit drugs. Can't get price recovery, given the scale to which the phenomenon is in our society. Markets work and economies work even in illicit markets. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's a proposition. In that regard, we're seeing this conspicuous consumption is reflected in the airport numbers. Dublin Airport's gone from 18 million passengers to 32 million passengers. Think about the conversations you overhear in coffee shops and people where they've been and where they've been away over Christmas. I'm not a killjoy, I'm just expressing where people are spending their money. But they're not putting it back into the public infrastructure in sufficient um, a way. The other feature that we've observed in the last number of years is that the scarce construction resources are getting sucked up by corporates as well, which is a positive thing because they're going to be Firms invest to put down productive assets which themselves will have recurring income into the future. They're not spending an investment just to spend, get the money spent the year. They're putting something into the ground, machinery, equipment, building construction, the intellectual property, so they'll have recurring income 
over the next number of years. And the investment in Ireland right now is absolutely gargantuan. Gargantuan. The SRI, in their latest forecast, suggests that investment in Ireland by firms this year will be 120 billion euros. Now think about that. That's 2 billion euros or so a week. The iconic and spectacular investment that is Intel in the west of Dublin, which again is an expansion mode, has taken 30 years to invest 15 billion. And we're talking about society that's now churning 2 billion euros a week. So in eight weeks, we'll have done the equivalent of an Intel lifetime in Ireland type investment. That is spectacular, but it also has huge crowding out effects in a society that's trying to cope with this scale. And so what we observe then is that we've spent three billion euros on refurbishment of existing housing stock in 2018, and we spent exactly the same amount on new dwellings. So the scale of refurbishment, both from the commercial, but also then into the private sector, those with the money and so on as well, we're seeing that there's a crowding out effect into the capacity to deliver on the housing stock for an increasing population. I just put these forward so neither are good nor bad. It's up to you to determine whether these are good or bad things. But they're explainable stories as what's going on. And the last feature, maybe to finish, uh, Michael, on this one, is that if we are a resource economy and if we are a frontier economy, and if we're the family that is the possibly the ones that want to have a good time for half a generation as the ones that might be wanting to put down the long term. So in other words, we found oil or gas. Are we going to be in Norway or are we going to be uh, a Middle Eastern country? Let's put it that way. Well, what would you might observe? Well, one thing you might observe is the labor market responses. So stereotypically, and this may be unfair, but stereotypically to the oil-rich uh, Middle Eastern um, societies, one of the phenomena that they've observed over time is the indigenous population stops working and dabbles. Not, doing, not that not doing anything, but they don't have to work. In fact, they supplement the society by bringing in people at both ends of the, of the spectrum for uh, low, low um, paid work and then specialists for teaching and medicine and et cetera, et cetera, and sports stars and so on. Um, there's a solution for the FAI. Um, they, um, so in that regard, we see that the participation rate starts to fall dramatically. So while Ireland is now at 2.3 million people at work, and about 100,000 or so unemployed in that ILO measure, so we've got 2.4 million people in the labour force, that 2.4 million is actually only 62% of the population in the age bracket 18 to 65. 65 may no longer be politically correct, but just for the sake of the number. That means 38% of the population are not participating. And then the question is, are they not participating because of why? So we've got the same amount of sick people and uh, uh, people who physically can't work. It's not disproportionate, I'm sure, in other societies. So we also have much more children, more care responsibilities, childcare being expensive, getting to work being expensive, hard to get two buses, uh, taxation system is punishing at the margin, etc. These are all reasons why. But there are affluent reasons. Now you might like the word affluence about that because people say it's a legitimate reason I'm not doing it. I'm not saying you're work shy, I'm just saying if you really had to work for the household, if there's jobs there, then you would. And there's plenty of jobs there, and you're not doing it, so therefore, you made a choice not to work because you didn't, because of reasons why you felt you weren't going to do it. This is not a moral judgment. I'm just, I'm just explaining why we are experiencing this affluence. We're also seeing in the younger age cohorts, they're dabbling a lot more, as we would describe in the past, in finding themselves. Uh, so staying longer in education, or staying longer in going away and coming back and you know, beginning to postpone the start line. And again, that's great. That's a great choice to have. But it's an affluent choice. It's not an austerity choice. And so in that regard, the, last, the very last point I want to make, which I think is probably the most serious one, 
is all of this largesse, and it's great, uh, people don't believe it, of course, they uh, they say, I don't feel it, um, and also I see, I can see why the market found me and rewarded me, but I just can't explain my neighbour, they're real dumbasses, I don't know how they're doing the same living standards as me, um, but in that regard, you're seeing, um, you've seen this kind of relativity piece that people legitimately have, uh, uh, they're disconcerted. Um, so, you know, proves that money can't make you happy. Um, but what we're then trying to figure out is where are we in this regard? Well, first of all, the median Irish household now has 50%, 50% more income than the UK equivalent. It's that dramatic, what's been occurring here. And again, people say, oh, I don't believe that. But What's your term of reference? Well, in rural Ireland, people compared to Dublin, but actually just think of Ball's Bridge. They never take account of the whole of the city and the various areas of the city. In fact, rural Ireland is actually has a higher disposable income than urban Ireland. Through the household budget survey again, we see that. Very often, people will go to the urban to make the money and bring it back to the parish to live in, etc. But this imbalance is not actually as apparent as, as those describe it. So the imbalances in our society are sure there, but they're not as dramatic, and the absolute level is very high. But the bit that I worry about most, and this um, caused consternation to some of the more right-wing um, fellow travellers, as they might have seen me as, um, is that the state is potentially getting too small for the scale of the resources that are now in our society. And I think the labour market is probably the part that I would put forward as a proposition on this. My numbers are not going to be precise, but they're roughly correct. Of the 2.3 million at work, 0.3 is the public sector. It's 350,000, but run with me at the 0.3. When we were 1.5 million, we had 0.3 public sector workers as well. So in other words, what we've observed is the private sector has gone from 1.2 million workers to 2 million workers. We've got 800,000 more private sector workers and no extra public sector workers. As I said, I'm being imprecise, but just for effect. A rich society, I don't know what the answer is in the ratios, but it seems suspicious to me that we're in this scenario of what a rich society actually wants in terms of public sector infrastructure and public sector delivery that we would allow get that ratio imbalance get so low because rich societies want better public services, but they are provided through people very often, be they planners or teachers or medics or, crucially, security. And so if you use a thought experiment that I've put forward before, if it is the case that our primary schools have a ratio of 28 to 1, again, I don't know if that's a correct number or not, it's a thought experiment, why, as a rich society, don't we go for 14 to 1? So, of course, in that sentence, I've doubled the teachers. But why stop at 14 to 1? And you might say, well, I've lost the run of myself now, right? But by revealed preference, this society actually likes to have an Oxbridge tutorial system when it comes to the education of their children. It's called grinds. And Irish households have been doing grinds in my lifetime, time immemorial. Even when I was in short pants, the word grinds was familiar to me, even in working class household. So we have a revealed preference, actually, for just in that one item um, to more. So it seems stunning that we're allowing this ratio to go without any commentary. But it has huge manifestations. And the last one is clearly on security. I can think of no worse labor market story than about our defense forces. On both ends of the command chain, the capacity to earn a living, to be able to be there to defend us in the defense forces, and particularly in the Navy and the ships that can't go out because they can't crew them, and that some of the Navy who are living on the ships because they can't get accommodation. And at the other end of the officer class, the phenomenon that's been observed in the Air Corps for years of people being bought out by the private sector. We're now seeing it in cybersecurity and so on. The real issue we have to confront is, given that we're now rich and in charge of so many assets, those two billion euros a week are building up into massive assets that we can physically see all around us, are we certain that we actually have the critical mass of public infrastructure and public service capacity to ensure that we can keep this golden goose that we have and that we can actually be the family that makes future generations better off? Thank you. 